Ahlu Sunnah said that knowing the intellectual proof for the existence of Allah is a personal obligation. Whoever does not know it is a sinful believer. That is, Ahlu Sunnah said that it is a personal obligation to know or to have a mental proof that Allah exists. That doesn't mean that it's a personal obligation to have the argument ready to be able to express it or deliver it. It means that it's a personal obligation on each individual to have pondered and by mental evidence known that Allah Ta'ala exists. If a person never did that, then he's a sinful believer. Yes, he is a believer. We didn't say that he doesn't believe in Allah. What we said is that he did not exert even the slightest mental evidence to confirm by mental evidence that Allah exists. Then he's a sinful believer. If he didn't do that, what that means is that he is an imitator in his creed. And it's not permissible to imitate in the creed. We spoke about that before. To prove the existence of Allah, we refer to the existence of the creations. The creation is the thing that has a beginning for its existence. The thing that has a beginning for its existence is an indication of what made it begin is evidence for what made it begin because it couldn't have given itself a beginning. And in particular, the existence of bodies and their qualities because that's what the world is made of, bodies and qualities. So we use the bodies and their qualities to prove the existence of the Creator. Qualities like movement and immobility. To show that they are in need of a creator. We'll see why. It is enough for the individual to say to himself, had it not been that Allah exists without the need of anything, then this world would not be existing. And likewise, the rest of the attributes of Allah. Had Allah not been attributed with them, this world would not be existing. Had Allah not been attributed with knowledge, had he not been attributed with power, had he not been attributed with life, had he not been attributed with will, this world would not be existing. So one mentally says, there must be a creator who has these attributes. That's simple. It's not a condition that the person does anything complicated. Had Allah not been attributed with those attributes, this world would not be existing. However, this world's existence is confirmed. What's our evidence that the world's existence is confirmed? Observation. For us, that's definitive. We as Muslims, for us, our standard is that that's definitive evidence. Observation by sound senses. And so Allah must exist. Also, it is a mental proof for the person to say to himself, I am after I was not. And whatever is after it was not must have something to make it be. So I must have someone who made me be. The one who made me be exists and is not like anything. And his name is Allah. Now, the name Allah is not known by a mental evidence. The name Allah is known by that name being conveyed to us. Among the proofs is for the person to say the world changes and everything that changes is an event. Wait, the world changes. Okay. 
and everything that changes is an event. Okay. So the world is an event. Fine. Every event is in need of the one who made it occur. Why? Because it can't make itself occur. Event by definition means it has a beginning. It can't make itself occur. So it is in need of the one who made it occur. That's fine. And that one who made it occur does not resemble anything and is attributed with the attributes that we have already mentioned. The scholars have also mentioned detailed evidence for the existence of Allah. What we just discussed was general and simple. That is what an Nasafi signaled to when saying, وَالْعَالَمُ بِجَمِيعِ أَجْزَائِهِ مُحْدَثِ إِذْ هُوَ أَعْيَانٌ وَأَعْرَاضٌ فَالْأَعْيَانُ مَا لَهُ قِيَامٌ بِذَاتِهِ وَهُوَ إِمَّا مُرَكَّبٌ وَهُوَ الْجِثْمُ أَوْ غَيْرُ مُرَكَّبٌ كَالْجَوْهَرُ وَهُوَ الْجُزْءُ الَّذِي لَا يَتَجَزَّأْ والعرض ما لا يقوم بذاته ويحدث في الأجسام والجواهر كالألوان والأكوان والطعوم والروائح والمحدث للعالم هو الله تعالى Let's unravel this إن شاء الله والعالم بجميع أجزائه محدث the world with all of its components is an occurrence. That means it starts, has a beginning. There's different words you can use for something that has a beginning, such as creation, occurrence, event, happening. We are all of those things. We are happenings, occurrences, events, and creations. We come and we go. The world with all of its components is an occurrence because it is composed of entities and qualities. He's saying because it is composed of entities and qualities. So what he's saying is the entities are occurrences and the qualities are occurrences. And since the world is a collection of entities and qualities, then the world is an occurrence. We knew that the world was an occurrence because it's made of entities and qualities, which are occurrences. So someone might say, how do you know that the entity is an occurrence? Or that the quality is an occurrence? We know the entities are occurrences because the qualities are occurrences. How do you know that the qualities are occurrences? Because you observe them occurring. You see them starting and stopping. Motion and stillness. You see the, the motion come into existence and then go out of existence. You see a thing still and then that stillness goes away and it starts moving. And you see a thing moving, and then that motion goes away and it becomes still. So you see it occurring. Connection and disconnection. Contact and separation. You see a thing in contact with something else. Then that contact vanishes and it becomes disconnected from that thing. Then the disconnection vanishes and it comes in contact. So those qualities are occurrences. So the entities must be occurrences. Why? Someone might say, why? How do you make such an assumption? First, though, he needs to confess that the qualities are occurrences. He can't deny it. We just stated it clearly. So the qualities are occurrences. So how did we then say, then the entities are also occurrences? Because... The entities are bound to these qualities. The entities would not exist without the qualities. 
there would not be an entity that's neither moving nor still. And there would not be an entity that's neither in contact with something nor disconnected from it. So the entities are bound to these qualities. So if the qualities are occurrences and the entities are bound to the qualities, then the entities have to be occurrences also. Because... If the entities were not bound to the qualities, then it would be valid for the entities to exist before the qualities. And it cannot, the entity cannot exist before the qualities are existing. There cannot be an entity that's not moving or still existing before one of those two is existing. It has to be when it comes into existence, will either come into existence in motion or in stillness. Will either come into existence in contact with something or disconnected from it, from something. So it cannot precede those qualities. The entities cannot precede, cannot be before the qualities. And whatever cannot precede an event is an event. Whatever cannot precede an event is itself an event. And the qualities are events. And the entities cannot precede the qualities. So the entities are events. And the world is composed of entities and qualities, so the entire world is an event. And Nesafi continues to say, as for the entity... It is that which has a standing on its own. That means its existence is not following something else's existence. It is independently existing of another thing that's independently existing. And it would either be composed of two pieces or more, and that is the body, or not, such as the particle, the johar which is the piece that cannot be split into pieces. We spoke about the Johar. The Johar is the smallest indivisible piece. In particular, Al-Jawhar Al-Fard, with the word Al-Fard. Al-Jawhar Al-Fard is the smallest indivisible piece. Two of those make a body. Uh, I need to say a precise statement that I missed the last time we went over this lesson. A thing will have length, width, and depth if it is a body. The body is what has length, width, and depth. So the indivisible particle before it joins with another piece doesn't have length, width, and depth. When two of them come together, it will have length, width, and depth. And some scholars said, when eight of them come together, it will have length, width, and depth. So, the entity is that which has a standing on its own, and it would either be composed of two or more pieces, and that is the body, or not composed such as the particle, Johar, the indivisible particle, which is the piece that cannot be split into pieces. This piece, what does it have in common with the body? What it does have in common with the body is that it fills its own space. Although that space is extremely small, because this piece, this indivisible piece, is at the extremity of miniaturization. It means it cannot even be smaller. Yet it still fills a space. Like a body fills a space. But a body is at least two of those things. Once two of them come together, it's a new category. 
As for the quality, it is that which does not stand alone, meaning it exists through bodies and occurs in bodies. It exists through bodies and particles. Particles have qualities such as colors, aquan, motion, stillness, contact, and separation, flavors, and smells. These things are not bodies or particles. They do not fill their own spaces. In reference to the aquan in particular, take a note of those. They are these four, motion, stillness, contact, and separation. If you ever want to argue that the world is created and therefore needs a creator, then use these, the equine, because there is no thing that has its own standing except that it has two of four of these always. Out of these four, a particle or a body must have two always. And it's easy also to make someone comprehend that these qualities alternate. So they come and go, which means they're created. So keep those in mind in particular. The one who made the world occur is Allah the Exalted. The existence of Allah is not dependent on being created by someone because everything created has a beginning. And this is the case of everything except Allah. So if you speak to an, to an atheist, you might say, everything that has a beginning couldn't have given itself that beginning. He would say to you, in most cases, then who made God? And he thinks he's clever. He didn't even understand what you said. Everything that has a beginning couldn't have given itself that beginning. So he'll say, then who made God? So yes, that's being an imbecile. MashaAllah. God has no beginning, so no one made him. So then he'll ask you, what's your proof that God has no beginning for his existence? We'll come to talk about that, inshallah, um, with detail. The issue of being eternal. The existence of Allah is not dependent on being created by someone because everything created has a beginning. And this is the case of everything except Allah. Had Allah been with a beginning, he would be in need of someone to give him that beginning. And the one who is in need is not God. Section. The fallacies of the atheists. The atheists are of two schools. The first denied the existence of God and claimed that the world is beginningless. And they are refuted by all of the previous clarifications. We've already established that the world has a beginning. So we don't have to repeat that. The second denied the existence of God and claimed that the world has a beginning. Remember, claims are true or false. A claim can be true or false. So when we say they claim that the world has a beginning, that's calling it a claim doesn't mean that it's false. We agree with that claim. They are of three groups those who denied the existence of God and said the world has a beginning. The first said that the world created itself. The world made itself. This is impossible because it implies that the world existed before itself in order to create itself. And that it existed after itself as a result of being created after non-existence. This makes the world created and uncreated at the same time. 
and it makes the world the creator and the creation at the same time. And those people consider themselves the most intelligent of people. They are quite impressed with their intellects. The second group said that the world was created by nature. This claim requires more stupidity than the first because nature is a part of this world. And if it is invalid that the world would create itself, then more so it is invalid that the world would be created by a part of itself. Furthermore, whatever creates must be alive, knowledgeable, powerful, and willing, and these are not the attributes of nature. So what if you said that? What if you said, okay, the creator is nature? We say to him, that's still invalid because actually it is not valid for nature to be the creator because the creator has to be alive and knowledgeable and powerful and willing. So what if you said, okay, I say that these are the qualities of nature. And we say to him, so just believe in God and stop playing these games. We say that there's a God who created everything. There is one who is alive and knowledgeable and powerful and willing, and he created everything, including nature. Don't say that nature is the creator. The third group claimed that the world occurred by chance. This is invalid because, like nature, chance is not alive, willing, powerful, and knowledgeable, and thus cannot create. Also, order, coordination, and harmony do not take place by chance. If one of those atheists were to accept that a blind man could randomly hit a bullseye with a dart, he won't he won't really accept that except that he would say the chances are so slim he would not accept that he could randomly hit the end of the first dart with another dart and the end of the second dart with the third dart as a blind man because this um harmony or sequence or order this coordination is an indication of knowledge and power. Thus, how would he accept that this world with its order is a mishap? That all of this happened by chance. This in, entire, what they call, ecosystem. And even further, in their own imaginations of what they imagine the universe to be, is all working perfectly. Just fine. Everything is interacting with everything else, and then... So they're, they're creed, and they do say that it just so happened that all the right ingredients were needed, and and life came forth, and the, the environment needed to support life came forth. The air, the water, and lungs, and gills, and everything, it's all by chance. That's why... If you watch animal shows, whenever they talk about the special feature of an animal, they call it an adaptation. They say, this animal has adapted. Not that Allah created it like that, period, but that it adapted. That, that goes back to their belief that it's all by chance coming together and working together. The, the environment and the circumstances just make it come out like that. So you ask an atheist. If the atheist says that the world happened by chance, if we took a blind man, and let's, let's even blindfold the blind man, let's spin him around in circles and then give him a dart, would you accept that he can hit the bullseye? The stubborn one will say, yes, he can. It's possible. The chances are slim, but he can. You say, okay, fine. Can he hit the back of that one with another dart? And to, uh, he, he won't say yes. Not with a straight face, at least. Also, he would not accept that a pen would be on a table without someone to put it there. Nor that the table would be in a room without someone putting it there. Nor that the room exists without a builder. Nor that the house that contains the room exists without a builder. 
nor does he accept that the neighborhood that contains the house appeared by chance, or that the city that contains the neighborhood appeared by chance, or the country. What then made it acceptable to him that the entire world existed by chance? In fact, the world runs with undeniable harmony. Allah created the male and female. He made plants that are eaten by animals who do not eat meat, and thus they do not have fangs. And he made animals who eat other animals, and thus they have fangs. He created the birds and fish and gave them their shapes, gave them the shapes they need to cut through the air and through the water, etc. Allah said in his book, مَا تَرَى فِي خَلْقِ الرَّحْمَنِ مِنْ تفاوت. You do not see inconsistency in the creation of Ar-Rahman. وَسُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ وَبِحَمْدِهِ Allah knows best. So we'll stop there, inshaAllah Ta'ala, for tonight.